Well, we bless the name of the Lord for this is honestly the day that the Lord has made and what a great privilege it is for us to be able to enjoy the praises of God. I want you to know, if I hadn't told you in a long time, I love you with an incredible love from my heart to yours. I'm so glad that God has privileged me to be the one to be able to speak the word of life of Jesus Christ into your heart. And I pray that his word today to you will minister such grace that it will bring peace to your heart, strengthen you in your walk with him. And I'm excited about this series that we are moving in about CPR, creating personal revival. This is a time for some things that have been dormant in your life to come alive, to spring up with hope eternal, and for God to turn some things back on in passionate heat in your life to where you have a fervent fire burning and everybody close to you will wonder what is this thing that is going on in this person's life. And so if you will turn to our foundational text in Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 1 through 5 and notice here the word of the Lord, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. And then he caused me to pass by them all around and behold there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And so I answered, O Lord, you know. And again he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. This is CPR part six. We've all gone through, always already gone through five different steps giving you powerful keys to being able to have personal revival in your own life. This is about coming alive and allowing the Word of God to bring meaningful truth into you so that you live a life that is victorious. We're not just built to come into this earth and just live and die as though we were just inhaling and exhaling and we had no real purpose and meaning in our life. We were brought here so that we could thrive in life. You ought to be alive and having some high moments with God, learning to live in a dimension of the spirit that brings God's peace. We found that step number one is to go back to rediscover your purpose. Everything that God does, God does on purpose, with purpose, and for purpose. He's a God of purpose. He doesn't waste things. He doesn't waste his time. He doesn't waste his spirit. He doesn't waste his anointing. He doesn't waste his word. You are very valuable to God. You're not here as some type of protoplasm that just came together and, and formed some cells and said, hey, let's be something one day. No, you were created by design. There are other people that live their life by default, but God created you by design, and you're called to live your life on purpose, with purpose, and for purpose to the glory of God. That's key number one. Go back and rediscover your purpose. Number two is to revisit your passions. What is it that makes you come alive? What is it that you're doing when you lose track of time? When you could go and you'll do it even if nobody paid you? What is it? What is that thing that makes you come alive? What's that thing that charges you on the inside? What are your real passions in your life? Revisit the passions of your life, not just the thing that you do in order to make enough money to pay your bills, but what are you really passionate about? Who are you really that you become excited about waking up in the morning and doing this particular thing. What are you passionate about? Revisit your passions. Number three, it is about reevaluating the people in your life. Reevaluating the people in your life. It's, it's interesting how people make a difference of who we become. You have to learn that if you will show me your friends, I will show you your future because those closest to you will determine your level of success. You gotta have the right people. You need people on you who are in, on fire for God. If you're having a problem in your life, 
where you don't pray as often as you need to, then you need to include somebody in your inner circle who's a person of prayer. You might need to get somebody who's a prayer partner that can help you to encourage you to say, you know what, it, because they pray and I see the way they pray with the fervency with which they pray, I can tell that this didn't just happen overnight. This is something that is real and genuine. And so go back and, and, and take the time to reevaluate the people that are in your life. Here's number four. Re-examine the problems that are in your life. Now, everybody has problems. Absolutely nobody is exempt from problems. There's somebody who's here today. And you're facing a serious problem. And the thing about it is most of us don't just have one problem. We have series of problems with which we deal. So what do you do when you've got problems in your life? Problems are very, very interesting. And I, I want you to realize this concerning the problems that are in your life. Uh, just using problems as an acronym. Here's the P. The P is predictors. Your problems are predictors helping to mold your future. Predictors helping to mold your future. The R, problems are reminders. Reminders showing us that we cannot succeed alone. You can't exceed, succeed alone in this life. It's a reminder when you have a problem that you might need to ask somebody for help, somebody for mentorship, somebody for advice, somebody for direction. And then the O uh, represent our opportunities, opportunities, pulling us out of ruts and prompting us to think creatively. You have to have opportunities in your life. In every problem, there is also a built-in opportunity. Learn to look for the opportunity. The B here is blessings, blessings, blessings. Blessings are opening doors that we otherwise would not go through. Every problem opens a door that perhaps you wouldn't otherwise go through. The L are lessons, lessons, providing us instruction with each new challenge. In every problem, every problem is a school. It is. And you need to learn the lesson of that school before you leave that problem so that when you encounter a similar problem, it is no longer a problem because you've got the key. You've got some answers. The E is everywhere because problems are everywhere. They're not just confined to one place. We don't just have problems in government and problems in school systems and problems in Fortune 500 companies. If you've got a mom and pop operation, you're going to have problems. If, you, if you've got just one child, you're going to have problems. You've got 12 children. You're going to have problems. So problems are everywhere telling us that nobody is excluded from the difficulties of problems. And then the, the M in the, in, in the word problem, M are messages. These are messages that are warning us about potential disaster. And I love the, the last letter on problems. It is S, letting us know that problems are solvable solvable, reminding us that every problem has a solution. And that's good news. That is good news of the gospel is that every problem has a solution. God uses our pro problems to direct us. He uses our problems to inspect us. God uses our problems to correct us. He uses our problems to protect us. God uses our problems to perfect us. What a good thing it is to have the protection of God because he's moving in us, protecting us from all of the things that could so deeply wound us and harm us in our life. Here's step number five, is to recommit your life to prayer. Recommit your life to prayer. Prayer is not a toolkit for broken down situations. Prayer is to be used really for maintenance and prevention. It's something that you use every day in your life. John Bunyan said that he who runs from God in the morning will scarcely find him the rest of the day. Put God first in your life. Include prayer every single day. Seek him. Seek the Lord with all of your heart. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1 says, Men ought always to pray and not to faint, never to lose heart. We are encouraged to pray all, all the time, in good times, in bad times. Pray, pray when you get a bonus and pray when, when you don't have enough to make ends meet. You still pray, you pray in, in all at all times, you pray. And that brings us to number six, which is to renew your praise. Renew your praise. 
even before you had a manifestation of an answer to your prayer, as an act of your faith that you believe that God has heard you, you have to begin to praise God. I cannot tell you the number of people who have entered into a time and a season of personal revival because they learned how to transcend their problems and they thanked God almost as a down payment, a payment in advance for what they have prayed about. When you praise God, even before you get the answer, it is one of the greatest manifestations that you believe that God has already granted the things that you have petitioned him about. It's a great sign of faith. And I love something in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 and 16. Notice how it talks about praise here. It says, therefore, by him, let us continually, this him is Jesus Christ, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. This is by Jesus, what he's done for us. Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Now, I want you to notice something about these two particular verses. It talks about praise being the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name and it calls praise a sacrifice here the sacrifice of praise to god it's a sacrifice when it hurts you to do it it's a sacrifice when it costs you something in order to do it and so your praise might sometimes be a sacrifice because you may not always feel like doing it but make it a sacrifice. God honors sacrifice. God honors sacrifice. And I cannot tell you enough that the greater the sacrifice, the greater the blessing. Praise, which is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. When we give thanks to the name of Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who has provided for us, uh, uh, Jehovah uh, Sitkanu, the Lord our righteousness, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. When we just thank him and say, Lord, I thank you for my healing. And it is the fruit of your lips giving thanks to his name. You'd be surprised how a spirit of revival will begin to bubble up on the inside of you because you are giving praise unto his name. And it's a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice. But it's not just the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. The other sacrifice that is a part, an integral part of praise is, is, is noted here in verse 16. He says, and do not forget to do good. Forget to do good. When you do good, that's when you get praise. Do not forget to do good. Not all praise is verbal, just the fruit of your lips coming out of your mouth. Praise is also doing good and sharing. Do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Remember that faith without works is dead. This is more than just praise is more than lip service. Say that with me. Come on. Praise is more than lip service. Say it again. Praise is more than lip service. Say it once again. Praise is more than lip service. Then what more is it? It's also life service. It is life service. And we get the revelation of that in Hebrews 13, 15, and 16. It is not only the fruit of our lips giving thanks unto his name. Praise is also remembering not to forget to do good. To do good is not merely saying good. It's to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So our praise should not merely be audible, our praise should be visible. When you get into the position where you are doing good things and sharing, even when it may be a sacrifice, sometimes it's a sacrifice to do things and help your own family members and friends, people that are close to you, it's a sacrifice. But when you do that, you do good, that is going to bring praise to God because when you serve God by serving his people, you will cause men to see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Let me remind you of this, that how you are with people shows where you are with God. 
How you are with people shows where you are with God. So the Bible says, let your light so shine so that men might see your good works and glorify God, the Father who's in heaven. So when you do good, you inspire praises in the hearts of other people. If you bless somebody else by helping them to clean the house, giving somebody money to help them to get something to eat, you will inspire praise in them to God. I, I've seen people when I've been out on the streets and somebody will have a sign begging for money for food to eat, and, and, and it'll have on the bottom of it, God bless you. Isn't it amazing that, that they have enough sense to try to bless people who have given uh, them something? They want to, at least it causes them to bless God. I mean, I don't think that you can genuinely be in need and then somebody meet that need as an extension of the hand of God into your life without causing them to say, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. Even people who are not living right, you don't have to be saved to be grateful. You really don't. If, if you're in need, if your life has been hurting, if you've fallen down on hard times, and if somebody blesses you and supernaturally meets a need, and you realize they didn't have to help me, they didn't owe me, I'm not their relative, I'm not their spouse, I'm not their child, and yet they invited me in, they helped me. That very thing alone can make praise come out of your heart to say, God, thank you. Thank you for sending this woman. Thank you for sending this man to help me. Thank you. You, God, thank you. It might be somebody that works in an institution and will help your child to get in a program that they really couldn't get in because they weren't in the, in the right area or they didn't have any more slots available. And somebody says, you know, I don't know why I'm doing this, but, and they'll do something to be able to make room just for you. And that good that somebody else is doing will cause you to give thanks unto his name. So your praise is not only that that comes out of your mouth that it's just the fruit of your lips giving thanks of his name. It is also the sacrifice of where we do not forget to do good and to share with them. And with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. I wish that more church people knew that and understood that and applied that as a two-winged bird. Too many of them flap the wing of just verbal praise, the fruit of their lips giving thanks unto God. They can bless God all all day long and thank him, give him glory, buck and shout all day and all night. But that's only one wing and you can't get off the ground flapping one wing. He says, and forget not to do good and to share. You got to praise God. The fruit of your lips giving thanks unto your name is not to belittle that. We've got to do that. We, if God has given you praise on the inside of you, praise is not yours to keep. Praise is yours to give. We give God the praise. We were formed for his praise, created for his glory, to give glory back to him. The fruit of our lips giving thanks unto his name, blessing his name, proclaiming his name, the awesomeness of God. We are designed to bless God's name. But on the other hand, the other wing is to do good and to share with others. Did you know that when you do good to help other people, you actually feel good about that? It blesses you. It, it, it releases positive endorphins, not only in the recipient who's getting the blessing, it also creates a positive euphoric experience in the one who gives the blessing. That's why the Bible teaches it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Because when you give the gift, the blessing to someone else, what they do is receive it. But when you as a giver give it, what you receive is the gift of joy. You receive it and it causes you to just praise God that God was able to use you. And I mean, there's so many of us that have prayed the prayer, God, use me. Use me for your glory. If you can use anything in my life, God, use me for your glory. Use me for your glory. And nothing renews you in the power and in the purpose of God and, and then, then, then the praise of God using you to do good and to share with other people. So we have to praise him both with the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, and also in doing good and 
sharing with other individuals so that it becomes very balanced. And I want us to be a balanced church so that we are balanced to our families, balanced to our communities, because God calls us to be a people who will not only represent a strong vertical relationship in verbal praise upwardly to God, but also doing good and sharing horizontally some of the blessings that we have received vertically. And when you get the vertical in addition to the horizontal, you form the way of the cross. It is the way of the cross. It connects people to God and it helps bring heaven down to earth with what God has done in your heart and now you do good to others and share it and it becomes a great testimony that Jesus is real in your heart and that becomes a praise unto God and that's why verse 16 said and with such sacrifices God is well pleased God is well pleased he's not well pleased if he's only getting verbal praise he's got to get it to where you are doing good and sharing what God has done on the inside of you and so you really do show people where you are with God by how you treat people it's an incredible blessing do you know the Bible's injunction that says fear the Lord your God in the Hebrew it's really a reminder to see the invisible when the Bible says to fear the Lord your God it's a reminder to see the invisible because the Hebrew word for fear the Lord is actually the Hebrew word for seeing the Hebrew word for fear the Lord is the Hebrew word for seeing so think of it this way to see the Lord is to fear him to see the Lord is to fear him say that with me to see the Lord is to fear him say it like you really mean it to see the Lord is to fear him you know there are some people that as long as the person that they fear is not in sight they don't fear them it's almost like when the cat is away the mice will play but to see the Lord is to fear him so in the original Hebrew fear of the Lord is actually the word seeing and we fear him and we walk reverently and we live reverently soberly discreetly in the fear of God because we see him through our spiritual eyes we see that God is with us we see that God is with us but if you can't see God you lose your fear of him because you think that you're hiding that you can get away with something so my admonition to you today is don't let God out of your sight and what praise does praise brings the focus of who God is into your sight so that you see him so that you see him because if you let God get out of your sight you will start living like there is no God so the fear of the Lord is predicated on our being able to see God in our life and our family. See God, that God is watching me even when my boss is not around. That God is watching me even when my spouse is not around. That God is with me. And it is our fear of the Lord because we are keenly aware that we see him, that he sees us that it governs our behavior, causes us to do that which is right and pleasing in his sight. But most people never fear what they cannot see. That's why uh, we don't fear germs on stuff because dream, germs are microscopic. We can't see them. So a person, if we could see all of the stuff that was probably on our food, particularly when you go to a fast food restaurant, you don't know what those folks have done. You really honestly don't know. When you go to a regular restaurant, you don't know what they've done in the kitchen. Your meat could have fallen on the ground. And if you could just see all of the stuff, you'd be too afraid to eat some things. You'd be afraid to drink out of the glass. If you saw, if you could really see some of the stuff that is, is, is most dangerous, you can't see cancer cells. If we could see that when we were eating this, that it was going to produce cancer in us, we would be too afraid to eat a whole lot of stuff that is cancer causing. But the only reason that we don't fear this thing giving us cancer is because we cannot see it. If you can't see it, you will have no fear of it. If you cannot see God, you will live as though there is no God. And this is the very reason why we have to praise God because it keeps us with a God consciousness a God consciousness on the inside where we see him to see the Lord is to fear him so don't let God out of your sight don't let God out of your sight don't let him out of your sight touch a neighbor so don't let God out of your sight don't let God out of your sight don't let him out of your sight 
Praise is not a tool of manipulation to get God to bless you. I've been to some places and they're like, come on, praise him, praise him, praise him. If you're praising, God will give it to you. If you're praising, if you really need a blessing, you need your rent page, you need a new car, new car, praise him. Praise is not a, a tool of manipulation in order to get what you want from God. It's, it's not our whole idea of where we are stroking God's ego. That's manipulative. Manipulation is evil and wicked. Uh, manipulation is, is, is pretending like you're right to get something that's wrong. It's, 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 uh, it's using a wrong motive, a wrong pretense in order to get something. It is moving a person to believe that you are one way so that you tap into what motivates them, how they are motivated in order to get it out of them. And they're ma manipulative people. And so we don't use praise as a tool of manipulation just so that God will bless us because, you know, he's God. God can see through you. He knows your thoughts and uh, your desires, the very intent the intent of your thoughts. God knows the intent of your manipulation. If you give something just to be seen by people, do you think that you're really honestly fooling God? No, no, no. God knows if you have given something just to be seen. God knows if you've just done something nice just so somebody will pat you on the back and, and, and say, oh, what a wonderful person this is. And the Bible says when you do that, you already have your reward with you. So it's impossible to fool God because God knows your motive. The Word is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And because God knows your intent, if you've got an intention of manipulation, God already knows it. So you can't fool God by saying, oh God, I just praise you, I just praise you, praise you, just so that you can try to manipulate a blessing out of God. He knows the intent. Praise changes the atmosphere. It changes the atmosphere. You walk into a room and things are cold towards you, but if you will walk in and learn to come in and start encouraging other people, start giving praise generally. Give it generously, but also genuinely, genuinely. Find something that is genuinely praiseworthy. And let me just tell you this, in most places that you go, in most families, in most businesses, people are not appreciated sufficiently. If somebody does something, they serve you, you'd be surprised at the number of people who never take the time to stop a person and say, you know, thank you so much for that. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Brother. Join us again next time for Power for Living, where revelation is power, power for living.